Hey everyone, before we explore Ishii's life, I want to thank today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a fantastic online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes that I'm sure you'll love. Some great class topics include creative writing, animation, and lifestyle. A class that I have in particular enjoyed is How to Be Happier, Stoicism Masterclass by Ali Abdul, which has definitely helped me in how I do things on a day-to-day -day basis. If you love to learn and you're curious, Skillshare is a must, and it's a really great deal as it costs less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership, so you can explore your creativity. The Yana was an indigenous tribe that originated in Northern California, all the way to the central side of Sierra Nevada. Most of them lived on the western side of the mountain range. However, the Yahi were the southernmost portion of the Yana, as they were a smaller tribe consisting of 400 members who resided on the south side of the mountain range. Terribly, the vast majority of these natives were killed in the Californian genocide of the 18th and 19th century. This genocide consisted in a series of attacks from the Spanish, Mexican and local governments. The carnage resulted, as was to be expected, in the reduction of the indigenous population that lived in the California area. During this time, atrocities such as kidnapping, child separation and displacement were commonplace and even encouraged by authorities. There are estimates that in only 50 years, from 1850 to 1900, the population of these tribes in California decreased from 150,000 to just 16,000. It's important to mention that this was also the time of the Gold Rush era in California. As America expanded to the west, settlers believed they had to conquer this so-called new land without thinking about the consequences that it brought about, such as the destruction of Native American culture, communities, and its history. Moreover, these tribes were not only killed, but taken as forced labourers to work on mines and fields. With the passage of time, indigenous populations continued to plummet. But in 1911, the last survivor of the believed extinct Yahi tribe emerged. This was a huge media sensation at the time, with many referring to him as the last wild Indian in America. Although no one knows his exact date of birth, records indicate it was around the year 1861. During the 1860s and 70s, a series of massacres forced the surviving Yahi people into hiding. It was believed by anthropologists that in 1885, Ishii and his family moved into a cave which had previously been the home of a grizzly bear. The last remaining Yahi people lived here for over 20 years, invisible to the Western world. However, this isolation from the world came to an end in 1908 when a group of surveyors came across their camp. Inside, the men came across an elderly woman and also spotted an elderly man and a middle-aged woman fleeing. It's thought that Ishii was out fishing at the time. The men took several of their belongings and then left. Ishii decided to take his mother and relocate somewhere safer, but she was too weak to travel and soon passed away. Ishii was now alone and by 1911 was the last of the Yahi. In 1910, a famous anthropologist named Alfred Krober, who worked at the University of California, Berkeley, read about Ishii in an article which mentioned the possibility of a native Yahi man still being out there. Intrigued by this, Krober sent his assistant, T.T. Waterman, on a mission into the Mill Creek area to find him. Despite no contact being made, he did find incontrovertible evidence of his existence. Hungry and looking for food, Ishii came across a slaughterhouse in Oroville. It was here in August 1911 that he once again reappeared to the Western world. Following this, he was jailed, but shortly after, was taken into Waterman's custody. Waterman came prepared for their meeting, 
as he brought with him a list of short words to communicate with Ishii. Records say that Ishii was thrilled when he heard a known word come from this man. Of course, Ishii hadn't heard another person speak his language for over three years. Waterman wanted to speak even more with Ishii, therefore, he looked for a Yana tribe member named Sam to translate for him. Unfortunately, Sam and Ishii spoke two distinct dialects. Despite Sam's best efforts to translate, there was no major success. After this initial interaction, Waterman took Ishii to San Francisco, specifically to its university, where the famous anthropologist Krober worked. This would be a whole new world for Ishii, the last Yahi. It should be stated that when Alfred Krober first met Ishii, he asked for his name, but he didn't reply. The reason for this is because, for the Yahi people, it was uncommon to say their own name. Instead, friends had to say your name when being introduced to somebody. Thus, the only thing he said was that he did not have a name, as there was no one to name him. His name Ishii comes from the Yana language, meaning man. Because his relatives were killed at an early stage of his life, it's even possible that as a result, he may have forgotten his name. Yet, this remains a mystery. Now, in this new stage of his life, Ishii was given a room inside the Museum of Anthropology. Sadly, this wasn't apt for a place of stay, especially as he was surrounded by artifacts from many dead cultures, such as his own. Ishii spotted the bones of deceased tribal members, as well as harpoons, furs, and other instruments which belonged to his people. This may have been a disturbing experience for him, but most accounts state that Ishii was just very surprised by it all. Indian informants would often stay at the museum for short periods, but Ishii was different to these people. A big question was on Krober's mind. Could Ishii have really lived in hiding for around 40 years? And if so, how? He became doubtful, but wanted to discover the truth behind his story. At this time, newspaper reporters were desperate to photograph Ishii and his tribal dress habits. Yet, by now he was wearing typical western clothes, such as a jacket and trousers. However, Ishii complied with their requests and wore animal skins, but he refused to take his trousers off. In this new world, there were so many things which brought him wonder and delight, such as music, electricity, and water that came from the tap. But what most intrigued him were the huge quantities of people. Due to the size of Ishii's tribe, they mainly lived in small groups. Apparently, the largest group he had ever seen while with his tribe was just 40 members. Despite this, Ishii decided to live under these new conditions, where large gatherings were common. On one occasion, he was even invited by a journalist to a vaudeville performance. This type of entertainment was highly popular at the time, and it included classical singers, dancers, magicians, and various types of shows. Krober stated that Ishii didn't really watch the show, but instead looked at the 2,000 people gathered in the room. He did this for two phylax, which demonstrated his fascination from seeing so many people together in one place. It was also around this time that he received various marriage proposals with photographs attached. Apparently, many believed that Ishii should find himself a wife. One month after Ishii's arrival, Krober opened the museum to the public. It would go on to be a great success, but he had an advantage over other museums. Ishii, who was essentially a living exhibit. Ishii gave presentations each Sunday afternoon, where he would make traditional weapons. Audiences would buy the spears, bows, and harpoons he made with his own hands as souvenirs. Then, to make things even easier, Krober built Ishii a house behind the museum. Sadly, Ishii went on to contract pneumonia, as he had no immunity to unknown European diseases. In spite of this, people were still demanding to see him. Waterman suggested that a solution to this could be an exhibition cage. This way, no one would be able to touch him, being kept a fair distance away. Unfortunately, 
he was now becoming an attraction more than a person. Waterman and Crowbar were more concerned about the museum's exposition and their own pockets over Ishii's well-being. During this time, they were still trying to figure out Ishii's language. To aid them in their investigation, the men used the latest technology available, such as a palatogram, which identifies which parts of the mouth are being used when making different sounds, and a chimeograph, which can measure breathing, muscle movement, and speech. The men recorded Ishii and studied his language. During these sessions, he told them all sorts of things. Crowbar and Waterman eventually generated over 400 recordings about the native people's journey throughout life. Still, the great difficulty in accurately translating it meant a lot remained unknown. The way Ishii communicated his stories were very different to what the two scientists were accustomed to hearing. By 1913, the situation for Ishii's well-being turned around, and he was even invited various times to Waterman's house to have dinner. Records demonstrate that Waterman later considered him a close family friend. Ishii now got to learn a few hundred words of English, making communication much easier. Thanks to this, Krobo was now able to give Ishii a job as an assistant to the head janitor at the museum. For this, he was paid a small salary. He quickly assimilated into the American culture, travelling around San Francisco by riding the trolley, speaking to children and making friends along the way. Even though Ishii seemed fine in this new culture, the possibility of living with other Native Americans on a reservation was presented to him. Yet, Ishii did not want to live under those conditions. He said he would stay where he is and die in the same place. San Francisco was his new home. After three years with Ishii, Krober had learnt many things about him, but he still needed more answers. As a result, in 1914, Krober decided to go on an expedition along with Ishii, with the main purpose of finding out how he had originally survived. What is surprising is that, initially, Ishii refused to go back to Yahi land. Krober believed that Ishii would have enjoyed going back to the land he had roamed for the majority of his life, but Ishii had another point of view. For him, it was returning to where his family was killed. After a time of insistence, Ishii accepted and took his second long journey with Krober and Waterman, but this time he headed back to where he came from. Researchers at the expedition stated that they did not know for sure how Ishii was feeling, but that the look on his face was not a pleasant one. They expected him to be joyful for having come back to his origins. Instead, Ishii was more silent than when they first met him. While on the expedition, some of the first few words that researchers obtained from him were about how his dead sister was calling him. Suddenly, one night, Ishii's feelings changed unexpectedly. That night, he left the camp to connect with a dead family member. The morning after, he mentioned this to the researchers, expressing with joy and calmness that his people had found their corresponding way. This emphasised just how important life after death was to his people. After four weeks, Krober and his partners had been taught how to fish, hunt, and other useful abilities by Ishii. These were important skills when out in the wild, but that wasn't the main purpose of the expedition. Although the researchers found a deeper connection with Ishii through his spiritual experience, they were still looking to find Ishii's last refuge, known as Bear's Hiding Place. Eventually, they found the cave, but very few marks remained. Evidence about Ishii's lifestyle and homeland was limited. Following the expedition, Ishii returned to his home. Meanwhile, Krober continued to research about his life and history. In the summer of 1915, the renowned linguist Edward Sapir worked intensively with Ishii in order to better understand his stories and its meaning. Sapir had great success and gathered a lot of material. However, by late August, Ishii became quite sick and was hospitalised. Unfortunately, 
He had become ill with tuberculosis. Despite slowly getting better, he again became ill as he was still not strong enough to fight these kinds of diseases. Ishii passed away on the 25th of March 1916, aged around 55. For Ishii, death was a journey and to reach the land of the dead, the body must be whole. Because of this, Krober sent a letter prior to his death, demanding that no autopsy be performed on his body to uphold his friend's beliefs. Yet, the letter didn't arrive in time, and the autopsy was performed. Doctors removed his brain, which was later preserved. Meanwhile, his body was cremated. In 1917, Ishii's brain was sent to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington for scientific purposes. Ishii's death deeply affected his friends Krober and Waterman. Krober took a two-year break from his work and went to therapy. Meanwhile, Waterman felt a tremendous loss and felt guilty that the intensive work with Sapir brought forward his death. In August 2000, Ishii's brain was given to the descendants of the Pitt River tribe. He finally got the end he deserved. His ashes and brain were buried in a secret part of the Deer Creek region. His life has been the subject of various books, documentaries, and a film from 1992. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Ishi the Last Yahi. If you enjoyed, please leave me a like and a comment down below. And if you're new, why not subscribe? Make sure to have notifications turned on to get all of my uploads. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks!